I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I've come to the realisation that my podcasts are just as long and just as full of information as my podcast so at some point next year I'll probably scrap the podcasts and just stick with releasing a main podcast each week. I started out doing the podcasts every other week because I wasn't sure I'd be able to fill a whole main episode every week but as it turns out there are more than enough topics and more than enough amazing people to talk to and actually if I had more time I could probably release an episode every day and still have a backlog of content. I just need to figure out a way to update the website and add a search facility, which I can't do myself and I don't have the money to pay someone to do it. So that'll be something that gets done as and when. So on to my guest this week. And as it's Halloween in two days time, I'm speaking to Jo Ferguson and we're talking about bats. Jo starts by explaining her role as the built environment manager at the Bat Conservation Trust. Can you explain a bit about your work and the work of the Bat Conservation Trust? Sure. Okay. So a bit of background. So the Bat Conservation Trust was set up in 1991 um, and we're the only charity that really focuses on conserving bats and the landscapes that support them. Uh, We're UK wide, um, but our sort of core staff and our National Bat Helpline, um, which is the free advice service we have for householders, we're based in London. Uh, We have a Welsh officer and a Scottish officer um, and the rest of us travel quite widely. We're sort of only at peak times a core of about 35 staff with a UK remit so it's quite a big job for us so um, yeah we we kind of get most of our work done through partnerships and projects working with other organisations so um, yeah that's kind of how we get our our UK spread I guess. Um, For me the Built Environment Project has been running since 2007 um, and it was kind of a it came to a bit of a crunch point where we realised that we really needed a specific project or work programme to look at sort of the challenges for bats in the built environment but also you know a lot of the opportunities that the sort of the sector presents and so I manage this work program and so my focus is really um, as you would expect raising awareness in the industry on on you know bats as a protected species but um, impacts and, and sort of um, controlling for those impacts but also we've got loads of great partners and projects where we're actually looking at enhancement um, for bats in the built environment because um, really when and hopefully this will sort of come out as we chat when we're thinking about enhancing for bats we're thinking about enhancing for invertebrates so therefore pollinators so therefore there's the knock-on benefits to things like birds and other urban wildlife and then obviously the big thing for me is kind of that where it benefits people um because you know well bats are a they're a bioindicator so really where you've got bats doing well it kind of indicates that the ecosystem that you've got locally is, is doing well and that's you know it's obviously to the benefit of the plants and wildlife but also um as we you know there's this huge well-being agenda we really understand now the impact of a good natural environment on our own sort of physical and mental well-being um and so for me that kind of it brings together a lot of the things I'm passionate about sort of urban ecology and being in towns and cities is where people are and if we can get that connection with nature it benefits the wildlife and it benefits people so although mine is an industry focused job um it really it, the nice thing about it is it gives me scope to take those skills and I do a lot of voluntary work as well so what the project does is um I'm involved in sort of running a lot of research projects which help us improve our knowledge of bats in the built environment and then I kind of take that work to partners. Um, so people like the Landscape Institute um, and REBA, uh, Royal Institute of British Architects. We look at producing best practice guidance documents. And then the big step is, OK, how do we get that information out there? So things like this. So uh, blogs, podcasts, articles. Um, I run full day training courses. Um, I, I sort of lecture in universities. And also we have trade shows as well. So it's, a, it's quite a big spread that mm. I manage. Um, and a lot of what I do is kind of taking the temperature within industry and talking to my colleagues and looking for those points where people are saying, actually, we think this is going to be a real issue and then trying to jump in there um, and support industry through this. So, yeah, it keeps me keeps you busy, enjoyable, challenging. 
never dull so it's, <laughs> it's what you want really isn't it yeah definitely no, it sounds great yeah, well actually I also feel like I'm winning because I've got bats in my house so oh, I've got a good that's ecosystem fantastic. yeah <laughs> that's brilliant um but that actually brings me nicely on to my next question which was of I my bats live in my loft space um yeah but where else do they live normally so yeah so this is a good question because obviously the built environment is you know it's a big place and and kind of one of the main issues is the built environment has overtaken the natural roosting sites for bats and so that is kind of one of the issues they've had to you know they've had to adapt to so traditionally bats including the bats in your roof space would be roosting in trees and sort of ancient veteran trees with these lovely big hollows and cracks and crevices which we don't really see anymore or using things like the cave systems which they're either they've been um, disturbed through man-made use um, or maybe they've been gated and maybe they've been sort of sort of excavated out so no, you've suddenly got the loss of habitat and kind of um, increased levels of disturbance as well so for many of our bat species the man-made environment has been um, essential for for roosting sites all of them use man-made structures at one point or other during their life cycle um, and it's sort of worth saying here that bats don't use the same roost all year round so the bats that you've got in your roof do you normally see them in the summer yeah 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 so um summertime is where bats are looking for a really nice warm dry place um to raise their young normally so that the mothers will come together and crash the babies um and they'll want somewhere which is even ridiculously hot as hot as you poke your head into your roof space in the middle of summer and it's like 35 plus mm, it's but that's really yeah it's really fantastic for them because what they're trying to do is they're trying to feed and then they're trying to take all of that energy from their food and just pass it straight onto the pups so the mothers want to produce the milk pass it onto the pups they don't want to waste any of that energy heating themselves. So we have this really interesting thing where people are putting up bat boxes, for example, and they're thinking like bird boxes, you want to have them on the cool side of the tree or the cool side of the building. But actually, bat boxes for summer roosting want to be somewhere really hot and sort of south facing. Um, but the flip side of that is in the winter when they're hibernating, they'll use somewhere completely different. So they'll have somewhere that's cool and um, that's humid. Um, and they'll, again, they'll be saving energy. They'll be dropping their body temperature to sort of, you know, down to about two degrees and taking a breath a minute and basically slowing all of that sort of energy rich sort of um, energy um, sapping activity. Um, and they'll just wait it out really sort of November to March, which sounds great, actually, given the weather that we've had <laughs> recently. So and, and because there's no food for them as well. So the food disappears, the temperatures drop and they slow everything down. So, yeah, the bats that you've got in your roof um, sort of in the summer, in the winter, they'll go somewhere completely different. And that means that they need a lot of different resources Mm. um sort of in the in the built environment so warm roof spaces to sort of cold cavities in walls things like that and um, they'll be kind of constantly moving ah so i mean <clears throat> i live on the edge of an oak woodland so is it possible ah. they're going into the woods in the in the winter potentially yeah i mean it very much depends on the management of the trees so it would have to be trees that are big enough with you know those lovely large damp kind of cavities um, that when they're inside the cavity, they're not getting that temperature fluctuation. So um, one of the equivalents for them we find is um, spaces in tunnels, really long tunnels, um, ex-railway tunnels, where in the middle the air is really still and you've got, got this little microclimate um, and they can sort of put themselves into little crevices on the surface of the brickwork because you're not getting that fluctuation in temperature, they're not exposed to the weather and they're not exposed to predators. So we kind of spend a lot of time looking at what they would be doing in the natural environment and then looking into the built environment and saying, well, what what replicates that? Mm. And are they hibernating during that time? Um, when they're in the tunnels, generally, yes, because it's so cold and damp, but it's constant. It's that lovely constant temperature for them. So it means that they're not getting... Um, and this is sort of one of the issues for them at the moment with things like climate change. They're not getting that um, peak of warmth that basically tells them to wake up. Um, but obviously, that is a, a major issue for our bats. Now we're getting these warmer, wetter winters that bats are being woken up by the warm temperature, thinking it's spring, coming out and finding no food. So a lot of the work I do with the built environment looks at, OK, what are our impacts and what can we do? 
but we've also got other projects running the Bat Conservation Trust looking at, well, what are the impacts of climate change and things like that? How is that going to affect how our bats can successfully hibernate? Mm. Okay. Um, how many species of bats are there in the in the Britain and, and what are the more common ones that we might see? So most people are surprised to learn we have 18 species resident in this country. Um, and generally speaking, the further south and west you go, the greater the number of species. So places like Devon and Cornwall and South Wales are kind of real hotspots. And, that, and, and the rarer species tend to be associated with the rarer habitat for things like blocks of ancient woodland, limestone cave systems, which, again, you have more um, sort of at that end of the country. But the ones that we're most likely to see um, sort of in our gardens, allotments, um, that is kind of spaces, um, sort of our most widespread and abundant species, the common and soprano pipistrels, and they tend to be the ones that people have, have most heard of. Um, but they are our tiniest bats. So the adults are only about four grams in size. Um, and people, we, you know, we'll get calls for helpline where people think they found baby bats, but these are actually adults um, and they just happen to be, you know, quite fast flying. So they can duck in and out of the habitat. They can kind of get away from predators, which means that they can kind of tolerate the harsher um, sort of um, habitats in our cities. And they're the ones where you might see them. Um, people often describe them to me sort of going round and round and round say a tree in the garden or a bush somewhere where you're getting insects gathering and they have this sort of really flittery figure of eight kind of um, circling flight uh, and it's one of these things where people quite often think they're looking at birds and then it's it's a question of getting your eye in and once you see them then you'll kind of see them everywhere because we've got them um, all through central London for example I've done um, a bit of work um, doing monitoring work in and around Victoria Station and we've recorded six species there so yeah so they're really you know they're really starting to because they've had to the faster flying species in particular adapt to our urban areas. Is it normal to see them flying in the daytime because I have seen some that that look quite large actually but they've been out in the day and I've thought oh is that right or, or is that normal for some of the species? Um, they shouldn't really be flying about in the day kind of due to this sort of risk of predation. So in the same way that bats are um, light shy, um, you know, being out in the day kind of it leads them open to predation from things like hobbies and sparrowhawks. And actually, um, we're finding we've had records in you know places like London where the peregrine falcons are doing really well. The peregrine falcons are actually now hunting bats under lit conditions. So ideally, they shouldn't be out during the day. But things like we were talking about sort of climate change and warm weather and stuff. So we quite often get calls in the winter or photos sent through sort of to the helpline and stuff in the winter when, when it's become warm and bats are disorientated and they've come out. Um, and the other time is when they've been disturbed. So, yeah, if bats have been in a roost and somebody's come in and either it's building work or um, they've maybe they've started doing pest control treatment, something like that within the, the within the roost space um, and bats haven't been considered then the bats might fly when, just when they feel like they're under threat. So ideally they shouldn't be. Um, but like you say, some of the larger bat species that fly faster, they do feel that threat of predation less keenly than the slower flying ones. So they're the ones that I guess would be um, probably a less risk of predation. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, you mentioned lighting. Um, and So I'm mm. guessing that does have a, a detrimental effect on the, their normal habits um so can you talk a bit about that and maybe some of the other bigger challenges that are facing bats at the moment yeah sure yeah so big big focus for us over the last few years has been looking at the impact of artificial lighting on our bat species um and i think i mean i think we can all appreciate how bright our night skies are now but actually the stats are quite are quite scary so there's been some work done um using satellite data and between sort of 2001 and like sort of 2016 you've got you've got a sort of an increase from like 19 percent light polluted skies to around 99 percent in some areas of europe and the u.s so those kind of like pristine dark skies that our bats need are just um, are, are sort of ever dwindling and it, I guess it kind of helps put it into context so I found this out only last year I went to a talk on bats and evolution but there are um, sort of bat fossil records um, skeletons coming out of eastern Europe from about sort of 
50 million years ago that are kind of recognisable as our bat species flying around now. So people sort of say, oh, well, they're adapting to our cities and maybe they're evolved, but they've, they have evolved. They're kind of, they've evolved to be these like perfectly adapted nocturnal creatures. And then within the space of, you think about the last 50 years and the rate of urbanisation and lighting, we've kind of changed everything for them. So I talked about like fast flying species and slow flying species obviously the, the faster flying species they, they're going to be able to get away from predators a bit better and so they're the ones you tend to find in our cities um crossing gaps in vegetation things like that um in feeding in and around light but kind of opportunistically because um some of the lights that are out there especially the ones with a high uv content are, are sort of a real draw for insects um and they can really kind of create like a vacuum effect they're like a point light source in the environment and you'll get insects being drawn from all this lovely dark habitat where the bats are to kind of to cluster around these lights and so you've got the slow flying species which can't access this food resource and it's like a real double impact for them so you'll find them sort of falling away when you get into the urban environments but even the fast flying species who are kind of they're taking a big risk kind of all coming together and trying to feed on these these insects and opening themselves up to predation so yeah there's a number of different aspects to lighting uh, in terms of the type of light you use and where that lighting might be that can really up the amount of impact so you know our first advice would always be try and try and avoid lighting you know if you're creating this this lovely um, garden or habitat or green space and during the day you, you know it looks fantastic and, and rich with insect life but at night when the lights are on it can turn it into a real desert so it's it's been mindful of of how it's sort of that that night day contrast I guess really hmm. and what would predate them the bats at night if they were by a light source so at, at night or certainly it tends to be the risk times are like dusk and dawn. Right. So having lights kind of almost extends the period of, of day. So where you'd get, yeah, things like peregrine falcons or um, or sparrowhawks, hobbies, um, you know, it gives them an extra bit of time that, and then you have that overlap with bats. Bats are trying to come out and feed and you get that big upswell of insect just after dusk. So, I mean, and um, historically it would have been also things like owls as well. Um, and we have, we, we find a lot of the, quite intelligent bird species so things like our corvid so yeah crows and um, and jackdaws things like that that can work out where bats are coming and going so when they're coming out of a building if yeah, there's a bit of flat roof to that. stand on yeah yeah yeah. yeah there's a video there was a video going around um not that long ago showing them just basically just sitting just there picking them off as they yeah. came out yeah i think it was yeah. a seagull the one that i saw doing it uh yeah seagulls yeah as well i mean anything that's yeah again those kind of opportunistic feeders where they're um yeah where they're kind of working out you know how can I do this for the least energy possible like as well leaving the roost is just unfortunately a bit too easy for them um but the biggest predators that cat uh, that, that bats actually have are cats oh what is that's it the, mm. yeah that's the biggest issue for them and while lights I don't know that any work's been done to say either way um certainly um making sure that cats are in at dusk and dawn that kind of key period is, a, is another good way to to sort of protect bats and kind of another risk that they're up against unfortunately mm. uh, have their population numbers dropped over the past you know since you've been sort of monitoring um so sort of over the real drop has, re- has sort of been over the last hundred years things like intensification of agriculture and land clearance and the sort of increase in pesticides that kind of all of those impacts coming in um some of our populations we'd, we'd sort of estimated they'd drop by about 90 percent over the last hundred years um we've been um monitoring 11 of our 18 species and in recent years through the national bat monitoring program we've been seeing a stabilization in all of those species and an increase in three but it's kind of it's it's a long way to go before we're back where we were, and it and that's after um so you know bats have been fully protected under UK legislation since 1981, and we're only now kind of really starting to see the conservation benefits. So it is you know it's in that respect it's it's a positive message that things are changing, but we have to be really mindful of where things were, and you know there's still there's definitely still work to be done. Mm. Have you got any ideas about why those figures might have stabilised? um I, I, things like 
um, understanding the legislation and the awareness work that we do, um, people understanding their impacts now um, and having those kind of the stuff I work on, which is kind of having fail safes and systems and stuff in place in within people's normal line of work. So um, where you have risk registers for buildings, for example, knowing that that is one of the things that you need to be aware of, even though they've been protected since 1981, there's still, you know, in some places that information missing. So I would I would like to think it's to do with the, you know, the conservation work that's being done, not just by us, but at large, um, you know, we've got a number of um, sort of fantastic um, organisations, back groups, certainly volunteers out there, um, getting that message out there. But um, but yeah, it's still. I mean, with any statistics, you still got to be mindful that mm. there's um, you know there's a lot of other stuff going on that we probably still haven't got a good handle on. So you mentioned the laws that exist to protect bats. Can you just give a yes. brief overview of those? Yeah, sure. So. Um, our bat species are all fully protected under both international and domestic legislation and very loosely it protects the bats from harm themselves um, it protects against destruction of their roosting places because we've already talked about kind of how important those are for them raising their young and for hibernating and they need those very specific conditions as well so again um, the protection we're talking about here, um, it protects the bats, it protects their roosts, but it also protects their roosts if they're not present at that time. So if bats give birth to young and then they leave that roost, if that roost is then destroyed, even if the bats aren't harmed, then they've got nowhere to come back to the next year. And it might mean that they are less successful in raising their young, that they have to go somewhere else. So a, a lot of the understanding to do with um, why their roosts are protected is to think about how, you know they each each of those roosts performs a function as part of their life cycle and you kind of remove one of those pieces and it might be that um you know bats can't breed that year that they don't raise young because they only have one pup a year so if you don't enable them to be able to successfully raise that pup then again that's one of the reasons the populations had crashed so drastically because they're so vulnerable to disturbance um and this is particularly true of um when thinking about hibernating and, and female bats. So, um, I mean, there's lots of weird and wonderful things about bats, but one of the really interesting facts I like is that they mate in the autumn, but the females store the sperm inside themselves. And then only if they've had a good winter and they've, you know, they've got enough body fat and they can um, sustain um, a, a baby, will they get pregnant in the spring? Um, so they're only pregnant once a year and they're only for one pup. And sometimes it's not every year either. So, the, you know, people do see, bats um quite frequently now in our cities um and we are talking about the stabilization of their populations but they're so vulnerable um it's kind of on a knife edge you know it doesn't have to be a couple of rough winters a disturbance of a maternity roost and suddenly that whole area might you know their population might really crash so it's, it's kind of understanding their ecology which is a lot of the work that i that i do sort of with industry mm. God, i had no idea they only had one population yeah yeah they, yeah yeah this yeah. is it i think a lot of people you see them um you know see pictures of them and stuff and you think oh it's it's you know it looks like a rodent and superficially they do but their life cycles are uh no kind of nowhere um similar really you've got a, you've got a mammal it's, it's a really strange thing again you know they they book the trend essentially the, the bigger the mammal the longer you live and that tends to be a nice neat kind of chart apart from bats bats have this really, <laughs> really weird spike um and you've got mammals that are like four five six grams in size and um certainly the last recorded oldest one um in eastern europe was 41 years old wow so yeah <laughs> so you've got the thought? I know. So you've got so, so there's there's all that stuff that goes with it. So they have these roost sites that they come back to every year, and they have all these foraging sites that and commuting um, routes that they use. And more than likely, they're passing all of this on. They're very social animals, so they have this whole layer of ecology that you know if you didn't understand that you'd struggle to you'd think well yeah they can pick the populations up surely they can just have a litter of young and then you start to see the sort of vulnerability in the way that you know in their ecology and you start to understand really how they can be impacted so severely yeah definitely so if people wanted to encourage more bats into their gardens particularly if they're living in, in urban sites yeah obviously keeping the lighting down or off at at certain times is is important are there any other things that people can do yeah so I think 
what's quite nice is, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm always talking about bats, but really what I'm thinking about is urban ecology as a whole. So what's good for pollinators and other invertebrates so insect rich habitats um bug hotels but obviously plants that are really good for them nectar plants um but um with a bit more of a focus as well on sort of the night flowering plants and scented plants so things like evening primrose and jasmine anything that attracts moths really and um, that's a really sort of favored food by things like the brown long ears um, and another really good thing again good for wildlife um good for bats as um some kind of water source um, and that can be can be really small you know you can get a, you know a small number of insects because what we're talking about in our cities is due to the you know less sort of food than maybe um some of the sort of optimum habitats you're talking about a lower density of bats and you're talking about mobile animals as well so i think a lot of people think I'm um, in my cities you know I can't create you know these huge gardens and produce you know all of these these plants but actually um what we're really talking about is creating stepping stones um so everybody can do something small and I also like to say you know thinking about bed and breakfast as well so if you're putting up bat boxes put something in for them to you know to feed on um and if your neighbors are doing something similar or a local you know public green space is doing something similar then you're starting to join those dots really and you're starting to create these networks through the urban environment and that's kind of what it's all about really hmm. and what's the biggest thing they eat because I was thinking when you were saying about ponds I've got a pond but I seem to attract more than anything huge great big dragonflies which probably way more than bats but what yeah what, how, <laughs> you know what do they eat how big do they go when they're feeding so you're probably talking up to large beetle size, um, like cockchafer, that kind of sort of size of beetles. And especially you're talking, so some of the, the, the larger bat species, so the greater horseshoes, sort of like 35 grams, something along those lines. Um, uh, and again, they're also associated with what would have been the old uh, pasture. So you'd have had dung beetles and things like that. But obviously with the pesticides and that removal of food, but you're seeing that change over back again to sort of organic farming um, and redu- reduction in pesticides. So you're getting some of those natural ecosystems back. So you're getting some of those bigger prey items and therefore you're getting some of those larger bat species back in as well. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, they can come to my garden and eat as many cockchafers well, as they like because I well, <laughs> hate those. They're just awful when they start flying. And I know that's terrible. And they're clattering but, into things. Oh, yeah, smashing yeah, into the yeah. window like they're trying to break in. They're <laughs> just horrible. Yeah, <laughs> well, this is, yeah this, is the, this is the thing. You know, you've got basically for kind of, each size of flying insect you've probably got a bat you know you've got a bat species um you know that's going after it and that's true of that's true of them worldwide so they're kind of the last count 29th of july there were 1406 species of bat in the wow. world that's a lot. yeah a yeah. huge number and it's just like they're just plugging all those niches where there's a food source for them they'll kind of they've adapted to be able to exploit it which is really yeah really fantastic would they eat a stag beetle I think they might be. I think that's probably their limit. They probably are a bit big. I say that though. The great, great horseshoes do have a, you know, a really decent um, set of teeth on, and some of the larger bats as well to get through those kind of carapaces. So you never know. Mm, yeah. Well, not that there's a lot of them around for them to eat, but no, yeah, just, no, just and it, I, yeah, and ideally they wouldn't be going after another. Um, protected species that's where things get a bit awkward so <laughs> I think that they'd be going for a slightly smaller uh, right, stick with the cockchafers yeah. that's fine yeah exactly <laughs> so this episode is going out around Halloween um and I can't resist asking <laughs> the silly question will they yes. get caught in our hair or will they give us rabies because I'm sure some people still kind of ask themselves those questions yeah, and, and I think one of the things that I do and, and one of the things I always say at my training courses and my talks is there are no stupid questions when it comes to bats because I think there's so much mythology around them and because of that there's um, there's fear and there's kind of like Chinese whispers and people do kind of, yeah, some of these myths do really persist. So um, bats will fly really close to people. We get them, you know, we get, you, you've seen it probably camping and things like that, when you get a cloud of midges around you. So what they're trying to do is just get to the insects. We're like a little heat source in the environment and they're using this amazing echolocation system to be able to get as close as they can to pick off the insects and to not 
get caught in our hair. Let's not say it never, ever happens, but I, I suspect 99% of those stories are he said, she said type of things because they do get very close. And I know sometimes people get unnerved, but equally they are, when you actually see slowed down videos of them in flight, they are so incredibly um, manoeuvrable. Um, we've got a fantastic video that I always show in my training courses, which is um, one of our species, the natural is about taking a spider off a spider's web. It comes in and it, you can see it working out which side of the web the spider's on. And then it comes in and manages to pluck it from from the, the surface of the web. So that's the detail that they're getting. So they, they really, really try not to touch you, <laughs> basically. Um, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, similar for sort of the, the rabies. So we don't we are we are classed as a you know as a rabies free status uh, we don't have the classic rabies virus here which is associated normally with dogs we do have um a ra- a rabies virus which is found in an incredibly small number um, of our bats and only certain species so we have what's known as a passive surveillance program so if somebody finds a dead bat anywhere it gets sent to the animal plant health agency and that's members of the public or bat workers and they've tested over 15,000 UK bats over the last 33 years and then less than 30 of them have shown um, that they've had this virus. So basically, um, they avoid contact with humans. They're not normally aggressive. So if you don't handle bats, Mm -hmm. it's really not it's not an issue. Um, And, you know, but also to say if you founded a a bat that was injured or grounded, um, you can wear really thick gloves to get them into a um, a box and then you can ring ring our helpline number mm. um and well yeah provide those details um and you know we're here to give you that that advice but essentially if you're not working with them like a bat worker um you know on a regular basis then there's no there's no risk to, to the public much. yeah yeah are you doing anything to uh, around halloween at the bat conservation trust um we've got i mean the, the i guess the the sad time about it falling at the end of october is that Pretty much all the bats will be in hibernation. So, I'm, I, yeah, we're in the process now of kind of doing our last last bat walks and talks, which is a bit of a shame. Um, a lot of what we do now is getting people to think about, I guess, what you can do um, in the spring. So activities-wise, um, we, we're sort of saying to people, well, they're going to be asleep now. When they come back in the, in the spring and talking about sort of planting for them, constructing bug hotels for the food, making bat boxes. We've got a really simple... Um, uh, sort of plan of how to make one on our website so we're kind of looking forward already to the spring and then we've got loads of sort of fundraising ideas on our website as well I mean really is the sky's the limit we have people doing all sorts of amazing stuff making amazing cakes fancy dress um, all sorts of people really throw themselves in so this is kind of our it's like our Christmas Halloween <laughs> it's, um, it's our favorite time of year so um, yeah there's lots of stuff on our on our website um, but anything we always just say anything to bring people together and kind of um, kind of celebrate them they're fascinating and they're unique and they're still like we've discussed some of these myths persisting but they really need our help and I think once people again once people start to learn about them and once people see them up close as well so I'd say keep your eye out for we've got some amazing bat carers um, in the UK and some of them will be going along to um, sort of presentations and they'll have bats that they have in their care that can't be released and once you see them up close it completely changes your perspective so I would sort of challenge anybody to you know even if they they are still a little bit unsure about bats then you know please check out our website and find out more about them and I would hope that it would yeah it would change your view thanks joe yes if you're scared of bats or even if you don't know much about them get yourself over to the bat conservation trust and find out more about these amazing animals and how the bct are helping to encourage more back into our landscapes i had an interesting chat with joe after we stopped recording and i was telling her about the bats that live in our roof And she said, if you have any concerns about bats living in your house, particularly if you're concerned about things such as accessing your loft space, if there are bats there, or if you're thinking about having building work done, you can ring the bat helpline because it's been set up to not only answer questions you might have, for example, if you found an injured or sick bat, but also to help homeowners who may be sharing their homes with bats. And they can even come out and have a look at any bat roosts and advise you if they've got the personnel available. So it's an amazing resource. And of course, I've listed the number in the show notes, but if you'd like to jot it down now, it's 0345 1300 228. And that's a UK number. I just wanted to say thank you too for those of you who've recently reviewed the podcast. They've been lovely and you're very kind to take the effort to do that and I very much appreciate it. 
Also, a bit of housekeeping. Um, Twitter hasn't been sending me notifications or notifying me of new followers. So if you feel like I'm ignoring you, please do send me a DM or shout at me via email and let me know you're there. I'm always happy to chat. Finally, thank you to Claire Vokins for recommending I chat to Joe. Claire is an excellent wildlife gardener and I interviewed her way back in episode two about garden maintenance. So if you're interested, go listen to that or check her out on Twitter where she's at C.E. Vokins and I'm sure you'll be entertained by her tweets. Thank you for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.